What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Let's Talk MMA podcast. And if anybody's new here, pretty much just a podcast where I freestyle my thoughts on everything going on in the sport and then answer your questions at the like second half of this video. It usually goes between anywhere from 45 minutes to like an hour and some change. Man, that UFC 300 car was magical. I honestly haven't felt like I've watched a car like that in a very long time, ever since like UFC 217. And I don't know how you guys were watching it. My experience was sounds kind of lonely because I I had to watch it alone. I had to. If I don't watch it alone, it's hard for me to grasp all the techniques and stuff and the game plans going on. If I'm watching it with people, my perception changes completely. And I'm just focused on having fun watching it for pure entertainment, you know? So I was in my room, one of my light bulbs went out, and my brain was just firing off the entire card, trying to notice everything going on. And, and the pacing was really good. And I'm not talking about like the time between each fight. I'm talking about like exciting performances to like a slower more mellow fight. You know what I'm saying? Like with the co-main event, the Zhang Wei Li versus Yang Jianan. Thankfully, that wasn't as crazy as the Halloween Justin Gaethje fight was because I think we would have been completely burnt out by the main event. So that fight acted like a really good cool down for Shama to perform in the main event. Man, I wish Charles Oliveira fought a bit differently. He wasn't as aggressive in the stand-up and he accepted being on his back a lot throughout that fight, even when it was not going his way. Now, that's not the takeaway from Armin. I know that will sound like you know, we're not giving enough credit to Armin Saryukian. He deserved the win, especially after what Henry Gracie posted about letting your body go limp when you're in a Dars choke without the opponent having control of the legs. If they just have the choke and that's it. I didn't know this, but Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners would let go of their body and it relieves the pressure of the choke. So that's what Armin did. But I think Charles should have been a little bit more aggressive with the striking. I think he should not have accepted being on the ground as much as he was. Armin Saryukin has shown that he's able to handle the most dangerous submission artist in UFC history while he's in their guard, which is a huge confidence booster going into any single fight for him. Now, Charles did try to stuff the takedowns in the third round, but he did accept the bottom and didn't put enough of an effort, in my opinion, to try to get back up to his feet. But these guys like Armin Saryukin are a very tough style to handle, even against a very good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu artist like Charles Oliveira. And when Armin and punch that guy in the audience, man. There was no stopping him. We all knew who was about to win this fight. Armin beat two guys in the same night and then punked out another one. It was crazy. He's like, I think the guy in the audience was flicking him off. Armin wanted to fight Bobby Green because Green said he doesn't respect Armin. Just because he doesn't respect Armin, Armin had a big problem with him. As an Eastern European, I've noticed a lot of us have some really bad anger issues. Not all of them, of course, but it's like a stereotype. Some people say we're like emotional and angry and it is what it is. I even know some stories about this stuff. It, it gets Some of these guys take it very, very far. I know a guy who got a Glock pulled out on him because they thought he was cheating in a Domino's game and they weren't even playing for money. And he had to explain to them how he didn't cheat and it was all fair game. So many crazy stories like that, but with Armin Saryukian, this guy was flicking him off from the audience. Armin went to go punch him, like he reached in with that right overhand. I'm explaining this in actual technical terms. The guy pulled away from him, you know, so he stepped back so he didn't get hit. Armin starts walking, then he pump fakes his one other guy, making him flinch. Armin was on a roll that night. Three wins in one night, it's kind of crazy, but man, I wish Charles fought a bit differently. The first round was good, you know, going for the guillotine on his part, excellent. He won the round off of that. It was a very tight guillotine when they were fresh, not sweaty, any of that stuff. Second round was kind of dicey for him. Third round, yet again, you know, just being too comfortable off of his back. And in modern MMA, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to catch a good wrestler with submissions off of your back these days. They know the game. This isn't like, you know, 2010, where most of the wrestlers didn't even know what a heel hook is. And every time I see these new guys come into the sport and perform like Diego Lopez, it just surprises me, man. New levels being hit every single few years. It's absurd. How does Diego Lopez hit that hard? Yusuf might be a little bit chinny, just a little bit, but you can't hide that power. You know, you cannot mistake the power of Diego Lopez. Those are some short right uppercuts he was landing, putting him down, and then that one shot I think was on the temple. And this can make a lot of new fans not know that Diego Lopez is even better on the ground than he is in the stand-up. 5'11", huge for the weight class, otherworldly power, dangerous submission game. If he can get some good wrestling skills under him, he might be a future champion. And with that hair, I'm all for it, man. The emo Brazilian Mexican who throws hands like Drake uses ghostwriters relentlessly. Jamal Hill wants to fight Yuri Prohaska. He wants to come back pretty quickly, which I don't know is a wise move for him. He got hurt pretty badly, and Yuri Prohaska is also looking to come back pretty quickly. He even said that he's willing to fight Alex Pereira at UFC 301. 
They go and fight each other. Yuri is going to be the fresher fighter in there. He's got a granite chin as shown against Alexander Rakic. In fact, that revealed how powerful Alex Pura actually is on both sides from Jamal Hill to Yuri because Rakic is a big, powerful guy. You know, he can really sting you with his shots and couldn't even dent Yuri Prohaska. Yuri kept pounding his chest for that blue chakra, whatever he calls it. He says when he does that, he's strengthening his defense. And by defense, he's not talking about skill. He's talking about durability. He's rising. He's raising his stats when he's pounding his own chest. And Jamal Hill ate some big shots from Thiago Santos. But there's a clear difference between those guys and Alex Pereira, who was able to put them both down with a clear, clean shot of a left hook. Now, I do think Jamal Hill has the power to hurt Yuri, but Yuri's such an enigma. He might walk through everything and put Jamal Hill down as well. I did not think he would be able to take shots like that from Rakic, so maybe he surprises me yet again with this Jamal Hill fight. But we know for certain that Yuri's not going to get Alex Pereira next, at least for UFC 301, because Pereira has just come out and said that he not only broke one of his toes, he broke two of his toes. One before the fight and one after the second kick he threw at Jamal Hill. So he was fighting Hill with two broken toes and still made it the easiest win of his entire UFC career. Unrivaled with the Sean Strickland fight probably. He believes that he's not going to get medically cleared. How can he? You know, two broken toes coming back in a month. I don't think it's going to happen. And another thing that he did mention was the stepping on the foot was not on purpose as I thought. But he did admit that it helped him in that sequence. It didn't allow Jamal Hill to get away from him. But then again, Jamal Hill planted himself for the left straight as he threw it. He really wasn't going to go anywhere, at least not fast enough to get away from the left hook. Where it might have messed up Jamal Hill was not allowing him to step off on the outside foot angle with the lead foot. The fact that Alex Perez stepped on top of it may have thrown off the angle of the punch for Jamal Hill. But it looks like Pura is going to get Magomed on Goliath. That's the fight that should happen. It's supposed to be stylistically the hardest fight for Alex Pura in the light heavyweight division. And for some reason, Uncle Laiev is trying to call his shots. He wants to fight in Abu Dhabi. They need to fight in Brazil. You know, we haven't seen Pura fight over there yet. And as a champion, I don't know if we're going to get a bigger pop from the crowd than when like Vitor Belfort fought over there or something, or when Jose Aldo fought over there. Alex Pura might be the biggest Brazilian star in a very long time. You know, I could probably think back to Andrew to Silva maybe because we know Pereira brings in good pay-per-view they banked on him to headline UFC 300 he's big on social media everybody loves him Brazil should be his next destination and if Magomed beats him then Abu Dhabi seems likely and then Max Holloway and what he's gonna do next so Max wants Tapuria and as he's been saying many many times he's got options Tapuria is his number one option but it looks like Tapuria doesn't care to fight him unless he puts up the BMF title I don't know what to think about this I think they should put it up, but Tapuria demanding it seems kind of strange. And if I'm not wrong, didn't Jorge Mazadel when he had the belt, wasn't he able to put it up as well, but he chose not to? I think against Kamaru Usman. But regardless, Max Holloway should be the next opponent for Ilya Tapuria, and I don't think he should be able to deny him. He said he's willing to fight Brian Ortega. 16-3, and three, guy who fights once every decade, coming off one win, Brian Ortega. Although it was a good win. He'd rather fight Ortega than Holloway? Even if you just look at Featherweight, Max Holloway beat Arnold Allen and Korean Zombie back to back. Brian Ortega only has a win over Yair, who Holloway also beat not that long ago. Although Ortega did it better than Holloway did, the recent win streak is on Holloway's side as well. And Holloway has a win over Ortega, a very dominant one. I think Tapuria is not being serious and overlooking Holloway. I think he's trying to pull like a power move on him because he keeps mentioning how he's the champ. He's the big star. He gets to call his shots where, when, and how. I think he's trying to make a point in like a power aspect rather than avoiding him. That is the fight that's going to happen 100%. Unless Volkanovski comes back because Holloway did mention if Vol comes back, he should get the title shot first. I wouldn't mind seeing Max fight the winner of Connor versus Chandler for the BMF title. But no, Holloway versus Tapori is the fight to make. I'd rather see that more than anything else at the moment. I've always thought that Max Holloway would be a harder fight for Tapori than Volkanovski was. And I still think that today. Now, at 145, Holloway's not going to be as big, as muscular. He might not have as much power as we saw when he just fought Justin Gaethje. Do I think he beats Tapuria? No, I think Tapuria beats Max, but that's not going to be easy. Max should not exchange with him like he just did with Gaethje. Tapuria's stand-up style revolves around that pocket boxing and nobody else does it better than him in the featherweight division now he may not hit punch for punch harder than Justin Gaethje even though that's up for debate I do think Gaethje hits harder than him but I don't know if he's as lethal because of Ilya Taporia's technique in the pocket his body shots are absolutely monstrous man and he lines up that overhand on your chin after the body shot so well that lowers your defense lowers your focus of guarding your head opens you up for a knockout punch his foot positioning is excellent his shot placement is elite 
combining that with very respectable power. That's a kind of fight I think Max should try to avoid. And as long as the fight is at a distance, the more advantages Max is going to have over Ilya. I think kicks are going to be a bigger thing for Holloway in this fight than they were against someone like Justin Gaethje and some of his other opponents. But even if Tapuri is having a hard time in the striking, he does have the wrestling and grappling to go to. People keep forgetting how good this guy is on the ground. And Max has been taken down by quite a few different opponents. There are not nearly as good on the ground as Tapuri is. Even Yara Rodriguez was taking down Max Holloway. Now in those kind of fights, it could be kind of unpredictable. You're going up against a striker. The last thing you're going to think is him shooting takedowns on you. I think this happened both ways for Max and Yair when they both attempted takedowns on each other. But it's an MMA fight and these guys, especially in the highest level, need to understand that. Anybody can attempt takedowns. Alex Pereira and Israel Adesanya are the last fighters in the UFC you would ever think would attempt takedowns, and they both took each other down in their fight. So I do expect Tapuria to beat Max, but if Max beats Tapuria, he might become the number one contender. That's what it seems like the rankings go for Max, because he just beat Justin Gaethje, and he's ranked number nine at lightweight. Gaethje, I think, was like number two. Yeah, Max went up to number nine. Gaethje went down to number three after that fight. Oh, you beat the BMF champ, you beat the former interim champ, the number two ranked fighter who's on a cusp of a title shot. You took most of the rounds against him and then knocked him out in a decade-defining KO. We'll put you above Dan Hooker. Congratulations. Max Holloway is the number eight pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world, but he's only number nine in lightweight. Lightweight's just too good. There are seven fighters ahead of Max Holloway in the pound-for-pound -pound list of all weight classes, but there's eight lightweights ahead of him plus the champion and there was another fighter on UFC 300 that went up a division and beat one of their contenders that was Eljamain and Kelvin Cater was ranked lower than Justin Gaethje compared to lightweight right Eljamain did not beat Kelvin Cater as emphatically as Max Holloway beat Justin Gaethje. He didn't get a finish. He didn't knock him out. He didn't have one of the greatest performances we've seen in a long time. And he's number eight at featherweight. He's higher than Max Holloway, respectively, in those weight classes. How? How does that happen? Justin Gaethje lost to the number nine ranked fighter. Trash. No, I'm just kidding. These rankings don't make sense. At least we know that Max Holloway has options. As long as he has options, his number next to his name doesn't matter. Those rankings make no sense. Number eight pound for pound, but number nine at lightweight. And one thing I thought about Bo Nickel's performance was so it wasn't exactly what we expected. We expected him to have a very dominant, clear cut performance with almost no issues. But the fact that he did get some pushback and resistance from Cody Brundage might actually be a good thing for the fans to see. It shows that he is not ready for any ranked fighter at 185, and he needs to be built up more before he ever gets that bigger challenge. Now, what didn't make sense about Bo Nickel was him trying to trash Hamza Shemaev's resume. He tried to say that Hamza fought a nobody in his fifth professional fight. And the funny thing about that is Hamza fought Ikram Aliskar off in his fifth professional fight and KO'd him in the first round. The coincidence of Bo Nickel picking the fifth opponent of Hamzat's career. As an example of how Hamzat didn't fight anybody either. Do you know what Ikram Aliskarov would do to Bo Nickel? Ikram is a nightmare against the wrestlers at 185. If he could defend every single one of Hamzat's takedowns, Imagine what he would be able to do to Bo Nickel. And Ikram Aliskarov was smaller than he is now. He wasn't as good as he is now. He wasn't as confident with his striking as he is now. And because of those comments, there have been a lot of fans that want them to fight each other. Ikram Aliskarov, who's non-ranked, versus Bo Nickel. There's no way the UFC would do that, though. They're putting this guy on the main cards of pay-per-views for a reason. And that reason is not to fight guys like Ikram Aliskarov. Both Ikram and Bo Nickel are going to be ranked middleweights in the future. And there'd be no reason for them, especially to sacrifice Bo Nickel nickel prematurely but there is another sacrifice happening that is very sad dustin poirier versus islam makashev is in fact official so i made a video about this already before and it seems to be a thing now since armin saryukin was not ready to take up the challenge in like a month and a half which i don't blame him for you know it's not something that most fighters should do so dustin poirier got the call he accepted it of course this is his final shot at a title, and he's got to make the most of it. And that does not mean jump the ghillie. We know he's the head of the ghillie goose gang, but man, he would throw his entire title shot away if he goes for something like that. But it would be poetic. What if he did pull it and actually got Islam and choked him out? After all these years of failed guillotines, the only time he made it work was against the best fighter in the lightweight division, the pound for pound number one guy. He's been honing his skills in that guillotine every single fight for this moment. Islam is going to expect it though. 
whenever he shoots a takedown, the first thing he's going to expect is Dustin Poirier pulling that guillotine. I do think Islam is going to perform better on the feet than people expect. It's going to be southpaw versus southpaw, so it's going to open up the jab of Dustin, which is one of his best techniques. But I do think Islam is going to be kicking out that lead leg over and over again in that fight and try to come up to the top with it. But most of what Islam is going to do is probably shoot takedowns. And this is bald Islam. So we might see some German suplexes, some menacing ripping hooks to the body before he shoots. Bald Islam might be a new mythical fighter, as it seems to be a thing for most guys. It's like peak testosterone, peak masculinity, when you lose your hair or you shave it off. Bald Volk? was a whole different kind of fighter. Dustin had to go bald to bring all of his powers out there against Benoit Saint-Denis. Remember bald Ortega when he fought Korean Zombie? Still one of the best performances in Ortega's entire career. There's something about a fighter going bald. Even bald Connor was fighting pretty well out there. Arguably the best his boxing ever looked in an MMA fight. Nah, but RIP to Dustin Poirier. It's been nice knowing him. It's gonna be yet again another champion that Islam would beat. Another champion on the record. Then we could get this Islam and Armin rematch going. I don't think Armin beats Islam either. Wrestling wise, it could kind of cancel each other out. I think both guys are going to be difficult to take to the ground at this state of their careers in their primes. Well, actually, Armin's not even in his prime. Armin's prime is like in another couple years. Islam is 100% in his prime. But I think Islam striking is going to be the difference here. And same could be when Connor and Chandler fight each other. It has finally been announced. Coked up bald Connor incoming. No, I'm just kidding. Definitely proper 12 bald Connors coming to wipe out another wrestler with an overhand right. The style that he loves to fight. Nah, though, he does really well against these kind of styles. Orthodox, shorter, right hand heavy wrestlers. Stylistically, if Connor is not completely washed, he should be able to beat Michael Chandler if Chandler doesn't decide to wrestle. And that's the thing I've been talking about for what it seems like the last two years. Chandler has two options. The first option is a better way to win for him, but it's not going to earn the favor of any fan. Look to wrestle with Connor right away, tire him out, try to submit him, land big round of punch shots, but that's not what fans want to see out of Chandler. He's been fighting crazy and low IQ for a long time, and we want to see more of that autism out of him. More in this fight than any other fight. There is no other fight for him to show his autism than against Conor McGregor. So that's the second option. He comes out there and bangs it out with Conor. In the first round, someone's got to go. Give the fans a show, and if Conor McGregor gets knocked out in that kind of fight, Michael Chandler will become a superstar, and he will He'll get a title shot. There's no way they could deny him a title shot at that point. Not that he deserves it, you know, off of just one win against Conor McGregor, but it'd be such a big deal. All the casual fans will want to see it, especially after the post fight interview that Michael Chandler would deliver. He's a very intelligent guy, except when he's throwing hands on somebody. So I cannot wait. Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler is the most exciting fight for me. At an entertainment level, I don't think you can even top this fight. Two of the most exciting fighters in UFC history going at it. It's going to be fun, especially at 170, where both guys don't have to cut that much weight. Connor's been dieseling out. Michael Chandler's been dieseled since the womb. And I'm so happy for Michael Chandler that he got this fight. It's been a very long time he's been waiting for it. I can only imagine his thoughts when he got that red panty call. Red panty night. Red is a vibrant expression of violence, also of love. But as the great Nick Diaz said, you cannot have love without violence, and you cannot have violence without love. The ontology of MMA, thus violence, is of the color red. And panties are an undergarment, thus protection. A protection of violence can also be seen as defense, blocking, slipping, and evading punches. And this all situates at night, making red panty night a perfect description. And on that night, I'll see you at the top. Now, but who do I think wins this? If Connor is in good form, I think he beats Michael Chandler. If he's not, he's getting slapped. But one thing I do know for certain, this fight is not exiting that second round. I think the longest this fight goes is the second round, but I'm more likely to think that this is going to end in the first. So betting gods, man, I might just go with a first round finish for either fighter. Because honestly, at this point, I don't know who's going to win. I'm not too confident. I don't think it's intelligent to bank on a healthy Conor McGregor in good form. And Chandler hasn't fought in quite a long time. He's older. He will spaz out on his opponent, so that could leave him open to get countered. I'm just looking for a good fight and a first round finish. And did you guys hear about Alexander Volkov when he was talking about his sparring with Sergei Pavlovich? So it looks like this fight is going to happen, and Volkov has been saying that he's been not having a good time in sparring with Pavlovich over the years. When they spar together, Volkov's been saying that he's trying to avoid the striking with Pavlovich because he just hits too hard. He said when Pavlovich hits him, he like shakes him to the core, and he hasn't won a single round. Not a single round against Pavlovich in the sparring room. R.I.P. Volkov, if that's true. Because Pavlovich is looking to get some revenge, or at least get himself back on the right track after losing to Tom Aspinall like that. 
Look what this game does to friends, man. Look what it does to these fighters that are just close and they spend so much time with each other. Poor Volkov and Pavlovich. They probably scheduled like a movie night together, but instead have to fight each other now. Nah, I'm kidding. These guys have to fight each other if it's called upon them. Now, the way they announced the fight was kind of weird, but when you're at the top of the division, get ready to fight your friends if they're there too. Same thing with the whole Marab and Eljo situation. And you guys hear all the excuses some of these fighters are making, like Cody Garbrandt was talking about how he had vertigo and that's why he had to go to the hospital after and might be a reason as to why he lost. Maybe that was Davidson's punches causing vertical. I don't know when the vertical happened, but the way he was saying it, it made it look like it was during the fight or something. Does Davidson really hit that hard? Justin Gaethje said back in the day that the reason why he lost to Charles Oliveira or, you know, he had a concussion going into it. That may have been a reason as to why the punches hurt him as badly as they did. Ronda Rousey had something kind of similar when she was talking about fighting Holly Holm way back. She had a concussion. Her mouth guard was all messed up. She fell down a flight of stairs. Her weight cut was bad. And she wonders why so many fans find her quite annoying. Because she essentially said that's a big reason as to why she even left MMA. And she's still regarding herself as the greatest fighter of all time. How? You're not even a fighter anymore. You don't have to be delusional about it. I understand if you're an active fighter and you want to believe that about yourself to get into that delusional state so you can compete. But you're not competing anymore. So what's the point of being in delusion? How in the world can she claim to be better than or even greater than Amanda Nunes. She's not as skilled. She's not as technical. So the best part definitely goes to Nunes and her achievements don't even come close to Amanda Nunes in terms of competition that she beat. Nunes defeated every single bantamweight champion in history and featherweight champion, I believe, in history. Hold on, breaking news. Jamal Hill's fighting again? This early? How was he cleared? Well, he's fighting on UFC 303, which is the Conor McGregor card, and he's asking for a death wish. He's going up against Bangkok ready Khalil Roundtree Jr. Khalil's about to be training in the jungles of Thailand getting personally tutored by Sanchai coming out to the fight wearing the Muay Thai ropes with the Sarama music banging through the speakers if there's a time to get Bangkok ready it's for this fight if Khalil's lead foot is bouncing Jamal's gonna be in a world of hurt but this is Khalil's biggest fight that he could have gotten fighting the number three ranked fighter who is just number one contender by that time gonna be coming off a knockout two months prior Khalil can absolutely win this fight I don't know why Jamal Hill even is fighting this guy. Why is he even fighting a UFC 303? This makes no sense for Jamal other than like an ego move of him just trying to get a win. Erase that left hook in his mind. I don't know, man. I don't like this for Jamal Hill. He can absolutely beat Khalil Roundtree, but that's a very dangerous guy to take up after getting KO'd by Alex Pereira. And when Khalil Roundtree knocks you out, it's not just a regular knockout. He humiliates you. He beats you down like you never even belonged in the cage with him. The other fight that got announced for that 302 card is Sean Strickland versus Paulo Costa. So the number one contender versus the number seven contender. And I like this fight for Sean Strickland stylistically. Paulo Costa doesn't do well with jabs. He's in the way of those many times, especially fighters who throw them long. Costa's probably going to get busted up in this fight and his punches can get telegraphed. And it's going to be quite difficult to hit Sean Strickland clean with those kind of punches. But that's the thing. The cleaner... Paulo Costa fights, stick it behind the jab, throwing the one, two, the harder it's going to be for him to beat Sean Strickland, especially over five rounds. And thank you, this is a five round fight. Charles Oliveira and Armin Saryukin should have been five rounds. I'm happy they did it for this one at least. And that five round fight is going to be more suited for Sean Strickland to win. But the big thing going for Costa are his kicks. Light kicks, body kicks, you can spin him to the head like he did against Robert Whitaker. Condition Sean Strickland with certain defenses. This is going to be a tricky fight for Paulo Costa. And with that, let's go right to the questions. So first question we got by Troy Hartung. Hey Weasel, hope all is well with you, man. Why do you think Nate Diaz held out for so long with returning to MMA during his prime years? Both after the McGregor rematch and after the Dustin fight was canceled in 2018 due to Dustin getting injured. If he stayed active, do you think he would have had success versus the top 10 at 155 during the 2017 to 2018 period? If so, how much success would he have gotten and why? Nate was out mostly because of money. We know he got paid well from the McGregor fights like 5 million plus from each of those and most likely what was happening behind the scenes was him negotiating for a higher pay and more freedom to do what he wants I can only imagine that he wanted to box and do all this other sort of stuff as well as gain the right opponent that he respects which seems to be a big thing for Nate Diaz when he fought like Leon Edwards he had respect for Leon Dustin Poirier but that didn't happen Hamza Shemaev right Hamza's supposed to be the big bad young up and comer that was supposed to beat Nate Nate wanted to see what was up and also fight out of his contract but if he didn't walk out 
about after the McGregor fight, would he have had success if it's the top 10 at 155? Yes, yeah, some of them, but he wouldn't have been champion or beat guys like Habib. I don't think he would have beaten prime Tony Ferguson. Justin Gaethje would have been a really interesting fight. Same with Eddie Alvarez. A rematch with Donald Cerrone. Hard to say exactly who he would have won against, but I think he would have done pretty well in the top 10. There would have Samwise Gamgee. Hi, Weasel. Now with 300 wrapped up, please give us your thoughts on the following matchups. Maximus Holloway versus Ilya Deporia and Jacked Armin versus Islam 2. Also, what's next for Diego Lopez in your opinion? Thanks for the great content, man. Greetings from Baja. No problem, brother. 300 wrapping up is very bittersweet. Awesome to see the card end, but at the same time, looking at what's on horizon, the next couple cards are not looking great. Even the pay-per-view card with uh, Pantoja and Urseg. Honestly, that, that looks like a fight night card if we're going to be completely honest. But Maximus versus Ilya Tapuria, I don't think we're going to see Maximus. It's just going to be Max because it's 145. There's no way he's going to be that jacked as we just saw with Gacy. Like I said, man, Max Holloway with punching power at 155 is a cheat code. And I don't know if he's going to be able to have that at 145 the same way. I like the matchup. I think Max can mix up enough of his distance striking while constantly moving around to get to Puria guessing and fall into some high kicks. I expect Max to throw some flying knees and stuff like that. But he will be in danger whenever he closes in into boxing range. Or when Tapuria finally is able to get down. How Max Holloway's moving around the cage. He starts cutting him off. Intercepting him with some big hooks. Maybe following that up with some takedowns and ultimately doing his thing on the ground. I honestly think Ilya Tapuria's best chances of winning this are to mix up takedowns. He's been showcasing his boxing skills throughout most of his fights right now, but the pathway to beat Max with the least resistance is on the ground for him. When Max is able to expect your takedowns, he definitely does better against that, like way better against those kind of styles when he knows it's coming to him. But the danger of the hands is going to have to be respected from Max, and that's going to open up some of the takedowns for Ilya Tapuria when he pressures Max to the cage. Should be a really good one. And as for Armin versus Islam, again, I think Islam striking is going to make the difference here. Both guys are going to attempt takedowns on each other. I think Islam is going to be more willing to stand up with Armin, whereas Armin 100% is going to try to take down Islam. We're going to see some good body kicks from Islam from the open stance, you know, southpaw versus orthodox, entering with the long left straight and exit on that right angle, which is going to be behind both of their lead hands, forcing Armin to have to turn to face him. And Armin's usual attacks on the stand-up are a lot more predictable than Islam's, in my opinion. Especially on the linear line, Armin's best attacks and where he's most comfortable is when he's moving forward and striking. Not as well moving backwards and striking. Islam is comfortable doing both. And if Armin ever overextends with some of those big looping haymakers and overhands, he might get countered by the long left of Islam. And I think the tie clinch is going to be dangerous for Armin, as I do expect Islam to get into that mid many times throughout that fight, even counteracting some of the takedowns from Armin as he tries to drive Islam up against the fence. And what's next for Diego Lopez? I think a Kelvin Cater fight would be good for him if he wants to rise in the rankings as fast as he could, but it would be a dangerous fight for him. It's a big step up in competition. Then we go to Richard Connolly. Hey Weasel, I got a few questions. Hope you're doing great. Number one, when Habib and Oliveira initiated groundwork with Gaethje, did Gaethje do everything right defensively, but Habib and Oliveira were on another level, or was it more that Gaethje made clear fundamental mistakes that any fighter with a decent ground game could exploit and Gaethje walked into the traps? It's going to show both because Habib and Oliveira were able to make it look so easy, but Gaethje was making fundamental mistakes at the same time. It's something I studied even before, looking at his fights at the World Series of Fighting where he didn't even make much of an adjustment from those days, still gave given up his back just like he did back then. He gave us back against Michael Johnson, I believe, and he still made the same mistake against Habib and Oliveira. Now, the way Habib was able to get his back off of the caught light kick kind of forced Gaethje into his base, but his awareness even in that position was clearly lacking. Gaethje's mind resorts back to the wrestling days when he starts grappling with an opponent. Get up as fast as possible. Explode back up to your feet, which is the wrestling style that he had during his college days. And I can almost guarantee his thought process about the whole Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu part of this game is if I can explode up back to my feet as fast as I can, no one's gonna be able to take advantage of that. He doesn't have great hand fighting, doesn't transition well. Your second question, if Volk fights Mofsar at UFC 305 in Perth for the title eliminator do you think that's a big mistake and if it does happen at that time and place who do you think wins and how confident would you be three rounder firstly i don't think they would ever do that or at least until volk gets his rematch but if this were to happen would it be a big mistake i think in a way because volk is getting older he might hit a steep decline and look like a shell of his former self it happens to a lot of these legends when they get knocked out like this and he suffered two of them in a row and these are fights at the end of the day you know mobstar is a good fighter he brings a different kind of style that volk 
Hook hasn't fought at featherweight yet. A spamming of takedowns nonstop and just trying to log jam activity in the fight. Take over the pace. I think prime Volkanovski would absolutely destroy Mavzar. But a declining old Volkanovski coming off two bad knockout losses in a row like that. You can never be too sure. So I would still pick Volk to beat Mavzar but I would not be confident. Especially in the three round fight. Which is another kind of fight he hasn't been a part of in a very long time. And then number three. Have you seen Cejudo's videos about Sean O'Malley? They seem so salty and it feels like Cejudo is praying O'Malley loses to Marab. Can you imagine how Cejudo would react if Sean beat Marab and Umar next by knockout? I haven't seen them. Um, I've seen a couple clips of Cejudo being pretty silly and funny. He's actually funny sometimes. Like uh, I saw a clip on Twitter the other day. He was trying to like copy Pereira and he called him Poltan. He's doing the whole entrance thing, the walkout. And then instead of using the bow and arrow, he's holding his hands like he has an AR. But if he is wishing like Sean O'Malley is going to lose to Marab or Umar, I don't know, man. Sean's very, very good, and he's only getting better. I think he loses to Marab. Right now, it's not safe to say that he would lose to Umar. I think Sean is going to be very dangerous for both those guys, especially when they try to cover distance in order to grab a hold of him or set up the strikes in order to get the takedowns, which is something they usually do. Marab and Umar like to set up their takedowns behind their strikes unless they're panic shooting because they're hurt or something. And then we got the Mike Griffith. I got two for you. Word on the street is that Islam is better than Habib both on the feet and on the ground. Due to the fact that Volkanovski gave Islam such a hard fight, does that mean Volkanovski would probably beat Habib? No, I think Habib is a worse fight for Volkanovski than Islam was. It's a weird way to say that like Islam is better than Habib both on the feet and on the ground when it's hard to qualify. Technically, he does things better, but technique is not everything especially with Habib. His technique and his striking doesn't look high level. Just by looking at it, it doesn't seem high level. If you look at it at a fundamental lens, now his jab is good, his jab is good, right? But his footwork is so wonky, especially when he's getting pressure like he was against Ally Quinta. He even crosses his feet and stuff. His right hand isn't necessarily like clean form. Neither are his kicks on a fundamental basis, but he's extremely effective with all of that because he has that wrestling threat and intense pressure that he puts his opponents under. So he's able to make all of this stuff work. And he's very fast, like deceptively fast with almost everything. From his offense to his defense, I've always said about Habib and Islam, they have very good eyes. They see everything from openings to defending the opponent's strikes. And even Habib, not having the clean technique like Islam does defensively, like his head movements all over the place, at the end of the day, he is still able to avoid the majority of the hard strikes that come his way. And that's all that matters. Even if your technique is not clean, as long as you're not getting hit and you're making it work against the best strikers in the world, who cares how clean your technique looks? This guy was defending shots from Conor McGregor, Justin Gaethje, and Dustin Poirier. Way more than you would think if you just saw this guy's defensive striking technique. So, in a sense, Islam is better than Habib on the feet and on the ground, technically speaking, but effectively, I think Habib is more effective than Islam on the ground. In the stand-up, I agree that Islam is not only better, but also more effective than Habib. On the ground, I think Habib is just so ferocious on top with that ground and pound. His top pressure is just on another level to most fighters, and he is probably the best grappler up against the fence. He changed the game for so many fighters on how to use the fence against the opponent. So I think if Habib fought Volkanovski, Volkanovski would get taken to the ground, and as soon as he does, the ground and pound would be very, very different. He wouldn't be looking to just submit him, trying to get better positions and try to get his back and stuff. He would look to just punch his face in. And Volkanovski never had the best chin. It's decent, I guess, but I don't think that decent and chin is going to be enough for him to take the shots of Habib. Now, this is all hypothetical. Who knows at the end of the day, Volkanovski could just knock this guy on the first 10 seconds. He might be getting Habib on the back foot right away, pressure him, and catch Habib when he's crossing his feet and all that stuff. That might be a thing that happens as well. You never really know. But I would think, in my opinion, Habib would be a worse fight for Volkanovski than Islam was. But then your second question, I heard you say Gaethje would beat Masvidal. Masvidal has better head movement, better boxing, better ground game, and more. So why do you think Gaethje would beat him? How does a prime Gaethje who gets hit so much beat a guy like Masvidal, a guy who's way better at rolling with the punches, care to explain? It's going to depend on the weight class. I keep hearing that Gaethje doesn't cut that much weight for 155. And if he truly does weigh in the mid to low 170s, I don't know if he's big enough to fight at 170 against a prime Jorge Masvidal. I don't know. Technically speaking, I think Justin Gaethje is the better fight. At least when it comes to the stand-up, Jorge does have a better ground game, but can he get Justin Gaethje to the ground? And if he can, 
would he even be willing to do that? And look at who has better head movement and boxing and all that different stuff. There's a lot of variables that both fighters do very well. Mazadal has an excellent body kick. He's decent with the jab. He has good side kicks to the knee. Keeps opponent at a certain distance for him to explode on. Justin Gagey, on the other hand, has a very good jab when he uses it. Good probes to align the opponent for certain punches, depending on which side he wants to go to. A very dynamic leg kick that would punish Mazadal. And Mazadal's defense on the center line is not that great. Where Gagey would be able to catch him if he's extending with the one two and the follow-up left hand maybe even shifting with it that kind of stuff i believe would catch jorge mazadel and when jorge throws that left hand he usually drops it afterward which is going to expose him for the right overhand of geishi so i think technically speaking if they both were to fight each other and they're around the same size i would pick geishi to be jorge but because jorge is a bit bigger than geishi it's tough it's really tough to call if they go to yoel castro who would you rather run into in a dark alley pictogram jones conor mcgregor with a dolly or African Mike Perry. Is it wild to say that Mike Perry is the most mentally well-kept of those three and the least willing to fight you? And this is also going to depend on who you are. If you're an old man and you're in that dark alley, you do not want to cross Conor McGregor. And if you're a pregnant woman, you do not want to cross Pictogram John Jones. Where it seems like Mike Perry is a lot more inclusive. He welcomes everybody if you're not getting in his face, you know? Then we're going to Prince Malcolm. How many title defenses would Max Holloway have gotten if Volk didn't exist? Poor Max. I think he would still be champion all the way up to Tapuria. So let's look at it here. He had three title defenses before he lost to Volkanovski, and he did try his hand at 155. But instead of fighting Volk right there, he potentially would have fought Zabit. Because if you look at the rankings back then, Volkanovski was like the number two ranked guy when he fought Max Holloway, I believe, or something like that. And he already beat Brian Ortega, Frankie Edgar. Zabit was number three, I think, after Holloway lost. So it would have to be Zabit versus Max, and I think Max would have beaten him with a very tough first and second rounds. Zabit would not be able to last with Max Holloway's pressure and volume. So that would be a fourth title defense. After that, I think Max would have fought Yara Rodriguez, get his fifth title defense, then after fight Kelvin Cater, get his sixth title defense, then perhaps get a rematch with Brian Ortega for his seventh title defense, then fight maybe the Korean Zombie for his eighth title defense, then Arnold Allen for his ninth title defense, and then for his tenth, he fights Ilya Tapuria. Max Holloway arguably could have became one of the greatest fighters of all time, with a nine title defense streak until whatever happens in the Tapuria fight. But that jacked goblin from Australia had to start fighting in this sport. The bane of Max Holloway's fighting career. And he became one of the greatest fighters of all time. And crazy that Volk did it starting his MMA career in his 20s. That guy is special, man. And when he retires, it's gonna be it's gonna be quite sad. Then we go to AAG. Who wins now, Holloway or Tapuria? I'm gonna go with Tapuria, which is quite shocking for a lot of like new fans of the sport. If UFC 300 was their first MMA card that they watched, they probably think Max Holloway is unstoppable, you know, like amazing, which he is. He's awesome. Very good fighter. One of the best we've ever seen. But it makes you forget how good Ilya Tapuria is. Tapuria is absolutely no joke, man. That guy's a very high level fighter in every department outside of kicking so far. We haven't seen too many great kicks out of him yet. But his boxing jiu-jitsu are absolutely top tier and his wrestling is really good as well. Then we go to built-in MMA. Is it fair to say Arnold Allen and Mavsar showed more skill than Yair and Ortega. Ortega's stand-up is horrendous, and I think if Mavsar or Arnold got either of them instead of each other, they'd both be in the featherweight belt contention. Best wishes from Toronto. Thank you so much, man. Shout out to Toronto. From those two fights, yeah, I kind of agree with that. Ortega's always going to have a jiu-jitsu advantage against like 99% of the featherweights, but overall, I think Arnold Allen seems to be a step above, and maybe Mavsar as well. Allen showed incredible takedown defense against Mavsar of all people. If you could defend Mavsar's takedown the way he did and roll out of so many different scrambles, I don't see how Ortega gets him to the ground. And his footwork is eons ahead of most of the featherweights. I mean, he has some of the best footwork in the featherweight division. He's a better striker than Ortega. And against Yair Rodriguez, he could be the one that takes Yair to the ground and does his thing on top. Mavsar destroys Yair if he gets him to the ground. And Ortega versus Mavsar is a bit of a difficult one because Ortega's style generally counters Mavsar's. But I would say that Arnold Allen and Mavsar are probably at a higher skill level compared to Yair and Ortega overall. They're with the Tai Z HD. What did you take away from Peter Yan's recent performance against Song Yudong? And where do you think he'll go from here? Best wishes from Switzerland. Shout out to Switzerland. I love your guys' national football team. Well, now knowing that Peter Yan was pretty much 
a fraction of a man going into that fight. Peter Yan walked in there like the glass bones and paper skin fish from Spongebob and still got it done against one of the most promising young fighters in the UFC. The next fight for Peter Yan should be Cheeto Vera, but because he's so injured, I don't even know when he comes back. That's such a shame. Song Yudong is going to fight first before Peter Yan does. Then we go to Dapper Dan Man. Need a prediction on the number of eye pokes at 302's first event with the new gloves. Can you imagine after all this promo of how advanced these gloves are even though they look almost the exact same as the old ones? Someone just pissed on them. Part of my language. Watch when the first fight ends with an eye poke. Then Islam and Dustin both poke each other in the eye. Double eye poke knockout. Winner goes to Chris Wyman somehow. I really wonder how much these gloves are actually going to matter when it comes to eye pokes. There's one clear solution to this that we know from Pride. An MMA organization 20 years ago made gloves that makes you curve your hands as if you're almost always making a fist. And Pride, you barely saw eye pokes, at least from my memory. I don't remember many eye pokes. That would be a clear solution to all of this but for some reason we just don't see it and maybe these gloves are the answers maybe they finally go back to what pride did but we'll see then we go to uriel how would prime fedor do against the current tom aspinall that'd be a scary fight heavyweight it doesn't matter the era man these guys are always going to be lethal one punch away from a knockout both guys are very fast fedor has an incredibly dangerous ground game great judo if you attempt to shoot in on him believes himself so open when he's swinging those haymakers as does aspinall when he's throwing his one two and he keeps his chin up but he's doing a better job of lowering it if aspinall raises his chin fedor might be able to clip him with an overhand on the other hand the straight punches beat looping punches in a sense here tom aspinall might be the one that engages first with the one two and catches Fedor down the center. Now both guys have a very good chin. Fedor ate some big shots from some of the best heavyweights, danger strikers like even Merkel Krokop, whereas Tom Aspinall ate a big shot from Sergei Pavlovich. So both guys should be able to take a clean shot from each other, but I think Tom Aspinall would probably get it done. It's heavyweight, you never know, but I'm going with the younger, modern, brutally honest Tom Aspinall. Then we go to Nikitin Rai. How would Alex Pereira perform against the top 10 heavyweights? Poetan's final form. So so Pereira is tied to Ivasa, he does very bad things to tie to Ivasa. Sergei Spivak. Spivak is just too unathletic. Like, I don't even know if he can get in on Pereira without getting punched in the face. Marching Tibora. One shot, and I think Tibora goes to the ground. His chin is just chinny. His chin is chinny. Jelton Almeida. Stylistically, this is a very tough fight for Pereira. I'm going to go with Jelton Almeida. Alexander Volkov. That would be an interesting one. Volkov's very tall, fights really well from the outside. Pereira did fight U3 in kickboxing, who was like six foot five, and he beat him like twice, I believe, right? Technically speaking, I would definitely go with Pereira, but that reach and that height is a bit of an issue. I think Pereira would find a way to get on the inside and connect on Volkov with the left hook as he tries to lean his head away. So a good right fake into a leaping left hook is Volkov plods would be a good sequence for Pereira, I think. I think Volkov would be a bit of a sitting target for Pereira. Pereira versus Curtis Blades, I'm going to go with Blades. Actually, I'm going to go with Pereira because we know for some reason Blades would not shoot a takedown. He would like try to prove a point standing up with Pereira and then get knocked out for it. Even though stylistically, Curtis Blades should destroy Pereira with his wrestling. So I'll go with Blades, but there is a chance he gets knocked out before he even shoots a takedown. Stipe, I don't know. I don't know the state of Stipe Miocic in 2024. He's like 42 years old or something. He hasn't fought since he got knocked up by Nganu. I see those videos of him limping to the arena. At Stipe's age and condition, I have a feeling Pereira would chin him. But stylistically, Stipe should beat Pereira. The wrestling combined with the size should be too much for Pereira to handle. Sergei Pavlovich. I am going to go with Pereira, but that power is scary. And I don't know if Pavlovich would even shoot a takedown. Surreal gone. I'm going to go with Alex Pereira, as I've always said that. Tom Aspinall. I'm going to go with Aspinall, taking him to the ground and submitting him. And John Jones. Jones doing the same thing to Alex Pereira. Then we go to Thought New. How would the Tony that fought RDA and the Connor that fought Eddie do against the current top 15 at lightweight? Love the content, keep it up. MMA YouTube is taking over. Absolutely, man. So Tony versus Bobby Green, I'm gonna go with Tony. Tony versus RDA, definitely going with Tony, of course. Tony versus Benoit Saint Denis, I am going to go with Tony. Tony versus Jalen Turner. Going with Tony. He beats Dan Hooker. He beats Moicano. Loses to Holloway. I used to think he would beat Holloway, but not anymore. Beats Vaziv. Drowns him in the later rounds. Beats Chandler. Beats Dariush. Tough fight with Gamrot. I'm going to go with Tony, but it could go either way. Loses to Poirier. Loses to Gaethje. Loses to Oliveira. Loses to Armin. 
and loses to Islam. Now, the Conor McGregor that beat Eddie Alvarez. He beats Bobby Green, beats RDA, beats Benoit St. Denis, beats Jalen Turner, beats Dan Hooker, beats Moicano. I think he beats Max. I think Conor has one of the harder styles for Max Holloway to fight. In a five-round fight, that would be difficult, but I really like Conor's style against Max. I could be wrong about that though. Rafael Vaziv, I'm going to go with Conor McGregor, but that is a very good fight. Michael Chandler, I'm going with Conor. I think Conor knocks Darius dead. Gamrot is another tough fight, but I'm going to go with Conor McGregor by a decision based off damage. I think Dustin beats Conor. I think Conor beats Justin, but very close. That's pretty much a 50-50 in my opinion, mainly because of the leg kicks of Justin Gaethje. If he didn't have those, I think Conor would knock him out, but because of those leg kicks, it throws Conor's game off quite a bit, even from the southpaw stance. I think Charles Oliveira Vera beats Connor, but he could always get chinned. I mean, the Connor that fought Eddie Alvarez was so incredibly precise, and Oliveira has some of the weaker defense out of these guys. But if Oliveira gets Connor to the ground, it's wraps. It's over. And Oliveira hits very, very hard, being super precise himself. I think Connor loses to Armin Saryukian and loses to Islam Makhachev. Then we get to Tim Naste, who is the most delusional fighter of all time. We're all thinking the same guy, right? It has to be Anthony Smith. Have you guys heard the crazy stuff he's saying about Alex Pereira? And pretty much like every other fighter, he thinks all these other guys are not that good and he's just better than them all. After he got beat down by John Jones, he goes on record to say that John Jones is not that good. I just didn't show up that night. Smith, even if you showed up with a AR-15 in your hands, you're probably losing that fight. Have you seen Scarface when Scarface was all coked up? Taking bullets, that would be John Jones. Except John Jones doesn't go down. And then he goes to say, if you take each of John Jones variables, like each martial art that he knows, and look at those individually, he's not that good. It's when he puts them together that makes him a good fighter. What sport is this, by the way? Mixed martial arts. Of course, John Jones is not going to be the best at each individual martial art. He's not the best boxer. He's not the best wrestler. He's not the best jiu-jitsu guy. He's not the best Muay Thai guy. Like, he doesn't need to be. If he could put it all together and be the best fighter in the world, that's all that matters. Then he said John Jones' fight IQ is not that high. He's just well coached and knows how to fight by a game plan. Yeah. And not just that, John Jones adapts and fights. He's able to turn the game plans around and do what he needs to do, adjusting throughout. This was shown in the Gustafson fight. John Jones not only has high fight IQ, he is one of the most intelligent fighters we've ever seen in the sport. His fight IQ is probably his biggest asset. Out of anything else he's known for. He's also, I think, the same guy that said that um, Jamal Hill hits harder than Alex Pereira. I mean, he was so delusional that he had to make up a scenario in his head mid-fight with Johnny Walker. Like, this guy's attacking his family. He said Johnny Walker's attacking his family. What? I understand why he did that. He had to, like, pump himself up and try to motivate himself, I guess. Even though that was very delusional. Another fighter I could think of is Ronda Rousey. Her delusions are usually about her own abilities, which is a common thing amongst every fighter. Every fighter is delusional about themselves because they kind of have to be. But Ronda takes it to a different level, to an absolutely absurd level where she thought that she could beat Cain Velasquez in a fight. She calls herself the greatest fighter of all time. I don't know if it was her or her coach that said that she could be a boxing world champion. Yeah. And then we go to Mario Trejo. Where do you rank Max Holloway among the all-time greats if he gets his belt back? So coming back and beating Taboria, becoming a two time featherweight champion would he surpass Volkanovski in terms of like greatness at that point because I believe Jose Aldo is greater than both Volk and Max Holloway in a goat list because of what he did both at 145 and 135 but Max Holloway beating Justin Gaethje is a very big accomplishment then beating Tapuria he might be greater than Alexander Volkanovski overall but the, the thing is he lost to that guy three times so I don't even know if we can even say that I think if Max gets his belt back he will definitely be in the top 10 of all-time greats because both Aldo and Volkanovski in my book are. Even if he's not greater than Volk, he has to be like right behind him. So you could have the three greatest featherweights of all time all in the top 10 of a GOAT list. And then we go to Noodles. Shout out to Noodles, man. Hey, Weasel, I have a question for you. Who is the best boxer in the UFC? Max Holloway famously claimed he was the best boxer in the middle of the fight with Calvin Cater. And ever since then, this has been a popular topic amongst MMA fighters. And I am extremely curious to see what you think about Max Holloway's boxing skill after his stunning KO over Justin Gaethje. To me, there are four options. Dustin Poirier, Ilya Tepori, Max Holloway, and Alexander Volkanovsky. Who of these four is the best boxer and also more particularly who is the better boxer between Holloway and Tapuria best boxer in the UFC that's very hard you know the best of anything 
is hard to pinpoint down to. I think it's a toss-up between Dustin Poirier and Ilya Tapuria. With Dustin being older, I think Ilya Tapuria is going to surpass him and be deemed the best boxer in the UFC. So I think Tapuria is the safer option to go to. And that would also make me believe that Tapuria is a better boxer between him and Holloway. Now, this doesn't mean no one can catch Tapuria. Even if you are the best at a certain martial art, you can get beat there by another high-level boxer in this case, right? It wouldn't surprise me if Max Holloway is catching catching Taporia with his hands and just kind of beating him in most exchanges. Those three, Taporia, Holloway, and Volkanovski, are such good boxers, it won't be surprising if any three of these guys outbox each other. Then with the bean talk, where does Kevin Lee fit into all of this? Sadly, in the past, as the best prospect in the UFC. Then with the who's house football, who wins these fights prime versus prime? Gustafson versus Rockhold, definitely going with Gustafson. Rumble versus John Jones, gonna go with Jones. RDA versus McGregor, I'm gonna go with McGregor. Cormier versus Brock, I'm gonna go with Cormier. Cruz versus Barrao, I'm gonna go with Barrao. Gracie versus Maya, definitely going with Maya. Toivasa versus Hunt, I'm gonna go with Hunt. GSP versus Anderson, I'm gonna go with GSP. Nick Diaz versus Colby, I'm gonna go with Colby. Gegard versus Adesanya, I'm gonna go with Adesanya. Then with the Nelson, Goats versus the current champions. Ilya Tapuri versus versus prime Jose Aldo. I'll go to Poria, but it could go either way. I could definitely see how Jose Aldo wins that. Alex Pereira versus prime Anderson Silva. Definitely going with Pereira. Islam Makashev versus prime GSP. I'm going to go with GSP, but that would be a very interesting fight. I just need to see how Islam competes at 170. Like physically, how does he look there? For now, knowing that GSP is the bigger guy and they're both incredibly well-rounded, I'm going to go with GSP at the end of the day. Look at the ballistic fish. Hey Weasel, big fan. Is John Jones better than a high level bantamweight or lightweight we always hear that the lower weight classes are the best and ones like light heavyweight and heavyweight are the weakest yet jones is often referred to as the most skilled fighter ever despite being in those weight classes what do you think i think john jones is one of the few exceptions at light heavyweight that could be on par to the bantamweights and lightweights i don't think he's the most skilled fighter ever i think dj is probably the most skilled yeah but john jones as a heavier guy is one of the few exceptions that you can compare to the lighter guys he's that good but according to anthony smith he's not and that's the end of the episode guys i hope you guys enjoyed it and if you did make sure you give this a like make sure to subscribe hit the bell for notifications and i'll see you guys in the next video sniff it before you stick it